This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Everyone, welcome back to More Than Work. Um, this week's guest is just, I don't know, I'm always inspired. So it's like I'm always going to say the same thing at the top, but I guess that's that's okay because you can always skip this part. But this week's guest, Liz Bendit, founded a company after facing her own cancer diagnosis. She wanted to help other people and founded a company that practically does that. And I just thought, like for our chat, just listening to her talk about her experiences with that was really helpful and meaningful. I think a lot of us have had friends or family or even ourselves gone through um, health challenges and cancer is one of the most major ones you can go through. And just the fact that she took her experience and in marketing and took her experience with with fighting a, a disease and turned it into something, a positive company is awesome. Uh, one thing that struck me was she brought up at the end, um, Vladimir Zelensky. And I just want to say that I think there's so much going on and we've, a lot of us probably don't have Ukraine at the front of our minds, but I just kind of want to put that out there that they are still at war and the people there are still going through things and, you know, keep that in mind if you're thinking about ways you can help others. Speaking of helping others, Liz and I talk a lot about service and, and what that means to her and how she does service in her life. And I just, I, I really enjoyed hearing about that and, and hearing about basically in every way that she's taken adversity and turned it into action. And that's something that really helps when you are facing challenges. And so it's something that I don't, sometimes don't do. And, and I just liked being reminded of that. So I'll probably just leave it at that and just let you get to the episode. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Of course, like subscribe, review all that, but uh, thanks a lot. And I appreciate you being here. My guest today is Liz Bendit. She is the founder and president of thebombbox.com. So we're going to talk about that and her career and what led her to founding her own company. So thanks for being on, Liz. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited that you're here and just to chat with you about everything. So first of all, where am I talking to you from? I am in Leewood, Kansas, which is a suburb of Kansas City. Hmm. Cool. I think you're actually my first guest from Kansas. Woohoo! Yeah. Go Jayhawks! <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah i was watching a show recently where the guy kept trying to say like go with it oh it was on american idol mm -hmm. and luke bryan was trying to like say go whoever like so you said go jayhawks but he was saying go whatever team to the people who are from the south and That's he got right. them all wrong <laughs> <laughs> well in kansas the two major universities in kansas are university of kansas and kansas state university and there's yeah. obviously a very big rivalry between the two right now, in addition to running the bomb box, I also teach part-time at the University of Kansas School of Business. And so the KU icon there are the Jayhawks and they're on the final four for the nice. Madness basketball. And I had to move a, an exam because my students were going to the <laughs> basketball game and I don't want to be a jerk, you know. <laughs> That's really nice of you and compassionate. And I think actually my friend's daughter who listens to this podcast goes there, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, that's cool. Nice. Well, so we've covered Kansas, well, yeah. part of Kansas, and that's that's awesome that you're a professor. So first of all, we're going to talk about the bomb box. So why don't you say what that is? Then I want to yeah. get into like how you got there. Yeah, well, they go one in, they go together, right? So uh, the bombbox.com is a gifting site for cancer patients. I launched the bomb box after myself having had four different cancers over the course of eight years and receiving so many well-meaning but pretty useless junk, especially when I had breast cancer. Breast cancer was the worst. On the one hand, you know, all of the pink ribbon stuff is wonderful in terms of getting women to get their annual mammograms and remember that they need to have checkups and to check their boobs. All of that is so important and so wonderful. It's just once you are diagnosed with breast cancer, receiving a whole bunch of pink ribboned tote bags and t-shirts and coffee mugs when you're in the middle of treatment is super well-meaning, but not necessarily super great to receive. And at the same time, when I was going through all these treatments like surgeries and radiation, 
I needed stuff, right? I needed like ice packs that wouldn't leak through my clothes. And I needed, you know, lotion for all the radiation burns. And I needed, you know, something to separate my seatbelt from my chest because it really hurt. You know, the seatbelt was rubbing against my tender chest area. And, and I kept looking on page 72, you know, searches on Google for all this stuff while receiving, you know, gobs and gobs of unwanted junk. And I Mm -hmm. kept thinking there's got to be a better way. Why can't someone send me stuff I need as opposed to stuff they want me to have? And that was really the the logic behind the bomb box. I had this idea back in 2017. I always wanted to do it. At the same time, I was kind of miserable in my my corporate career, which we can talk about. And I started working on a business plan. And, you know, it was just always this kind of like fantasy idea that someday I would do it. And then Mm. the pandemic happened and all of a sudden my busy working mom life got a lot less busy. And I wrote a survey to determine, am I the only one that thinks that this is a good idea? But it had these two paths, right? So one path went down. If you'd previously had cancer, it asked you a whole bunch of questions about the kinds of items you would want to need and receive and to rate, you know, on a scale of one to five, a whole slew of stuff, like things that Mm. I had wanted to receive myself or that I did receive and didn't like, right? And then the other path, just if you had never had cancer, went down. If you're a gift buyer, you know, what did you spend? What did you? And because it was the pandemic and everyone was at home and bored, and I sent it to everyone in my email address book, and I asked people to share it, it went viral. And it was amazing and got over 600 responses, which was incredible. Nice. Yeah. So, you know, being like a marketing geek that I am, that's statistically valid. <laughs> yeah. And what was pretty amazing about the survey is that it totally validated that I wasn't the only one. And so when you mm-hmm. ask cancer patients, what is it that you want to receive and what would you like? The top performing items are all functional. Things that they wanted to receive and needed were lotion, lip balm, ice packs, things that got the absolute worst ratings, the ones that nobody wanted number like 50, right? Kicking cancer tote bags, kicking cancer Mm. coffee mugs, worry stones, inspirational poetry books, right? So, you know, you could see this trend of functional items being the most wanted and inspirational items is what I would call those things being the least wanted. And then you Mm -hmm. ask if buyers, what did they buy? Well, they bought mostly food and flowers and then inspirational junk. And so I thought, wow, there's this real disconnect between what do cancer patients need and want versus what are people buying? And that led me to say, okay, this is for realsies and I need to do this. And I took that summer and I made it happen. It was amazing. That's awesome. That's really awesome. And I do think, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think when people, I haven't, I very fortunately haven't had cancer, but I've, I've had quite a few friends go through it and, and my uncle and stuff. And there is that struggle of what do you do and how do you help right. and how do you, what do you buy? Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm a gift giver who does like practical gifts. So I'll more want to know, like, what do you need? And I know like people do meal trains and stuff like that, which is really, I think useful. Like if someone has a family to take care of, but then, yeah, I can see how, first of all, buying things that just remind the person of what's going on with them. Like they know already. And obviously their objective is to beat cancer. So getting a tote bag is really you know, it's well-meaning, but it's hard. Because say, talking about the kicking cancer stuff, in the, I, it's so well-meaning, right? Mm-hmm. It's so well-meaning. Everyone is trying to, like you said, they want to do something. They feel very helpless. So sending inspirational elements saying, I'm thinking of you is their way of, you know, productively showing that they're thinking of you. But it's not great to receive exactly mm-hmm. for the reason you've said. Like, I don't need a pink T-shirt to remind me I have breast cancer. And and I, and I you know, again, I don't want to, don't want to make gross statements. I mean, there's certainly a segment, I'm sure, of cancer patients that love that stuff. And they're those, those are the ones that then take pictures in it and post them to Instagram and, mm-hmm. you know, and they, and they get a lot of excitement and, and positive reactions to it. So I'm not suggesting that it's, everyone. But I will tell you the research showed the vast majority didn't like that stuff. It did not, it did not test well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I didn't, it was funny when you mentioned the like book of inspirational poetry. Yeah. My, my therapist actually gave me a meditation book called F that. And it was like, (laughs) these really funny meditations, like, you know, that fit me more than (laughs) 
than other ones. But but yeah, I was thinking like it was such a perfect gift, but I didn't even think about people get stuff like that. And I know for me, just having some certain health things too, I don't want to always be reminded or always have to reassure people about how bad or how good I feel. It's not helpful. So I, I just think you creating this company, it's it's so cool and it's so practical and I think can help a lot of people just know what to buy. So awesome. Not everyone can just start a company though. And you you mentioned having a marketing background. So can you talk a little bit about your career? Sure. So I have a, let's see, my undergraduate degree is in broadcast film communications. So I like to say when I, my undergraduate degree, I learned to tell a story, right? I learned how to story tell. I worked at Disney for a couple of years and then decided that I was much more interested in the business side of creativity than generating creative content. And Mm -hmm. so I went to USC and got my MBA. And those two, you know, I I, I say like, you know, I I worked on my right brain and my left brain. (laughs) And so then I put them together and I've always tried to steer my career towards, you know, trying to pull on both. And it's never been perfect. And I think that that is in some ways the that's what's been so fulfilling as an entrepreneur is that I really do now get to pull on both. In my 20 year career before that, I worked at a variety of businesses and brands and some that allowed me to kind of lean more on the left versus right side of my brain. Mm -hmm. And it was never perfect, but it's certainly, I learned so much, you know, so in every career I worked at an ad agency called Barkley for five years. I got to work on a huge variety of consumer products and brands. I launched my Sonic card for Sonic drive in. I did a whole bunch of relationship marketing and coupon programs for Blue Bunny ice cream. You know, I did a lot of relationship marketing there. And then I was director of marketing for a couple of small businesses. Westlake Ace Hardware was a conglomerate of Ace Hardware franchisees, and they eventually sold to Ace Corporate. I also was director of marketing for the Lyric Opera of Kansas City. Got to work a nonprofit, which I oh, cool. love. Was, that was probably one of my favorite jobs. And I went a whole 180 and went to be VP marketing at a commercial manufacturing company because they offered me a lot of money. (laughs) That was a tough one. That one was, I learned the lesson that work, you know, working in an environment of people where you don't necessarily fit in the corporate culture, no matter how much money, it's not worth it. (laughs) Yeah. I had one of those. Yeah. 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 That was a very, that was a rough one. Although I made a lot of money, it was helpful. So, (laughs) so, you know, I I learned, right. So I learned in all of those different roles, I've been both on the client side and the agency side. So I have a really good feel for what it takes to both hire and fire contractors. So, I mean, you know, all of these elements, I've had a very big focus on e-commerce and digital marketing and my various positions. So I learned. And so my corporate career really, I think to a certain extent has given me a perfect platform to train me to be a direct to consumer mm-hmm. online e-commerce retail store owner. But I don't, I certainly don't think I could have done it 10 years ago. Right. So I think that everything kind of mm-hmm. happens for a reason that the, the moon's aligned in, in just the right way for me. And for me, it was the, the pandemic was actually a gift because it gave me this kind of extra time to really take a moment like everyone else as part of the big resignation to say, okay, this is, this is what I want to be doing. How do I make it happen? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the moon's aligned for me in a combination of ways. One being I had this opportunity to teach at KU, which was kind of a perfect part-time job to give us financial air cover for me to go cold Turkey on not making any income and, and really helped us enormously in developing the business plan so I planned to go salary free for two years and can do so comfortably because I also, you know, teach part time at KU, which is, by the way, super fun. And I yeah. learned a ton from being part of that community and uh, my students keep me young and, and um, I even have one as an intern this semester, which has really been fantastic. So so that, you know, helped me a lot. And then also, of course, you know, I have two teenage kids that are very high demand and required to be driven all sorts of places. And my ability to launch a business also aligned with our ability to eliminate childcare. My daughter is now 16 and can drive my son places. And so all of a sudden that has opened up a lot of opportunities. So again, it wasn't just the one thing, right? It was a little bit of everything pulled together to make this doable for our family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it just sounds like you're right. Things just aligned. And so as far as your the job you left, had you thought about leaving prior to that? I think that, you know, if I go back 10 years, 
I've been obsessed with Shark Tank, right? You know, the, mm -hmm. I love yes. the idea, right, of being an entrepreneur, but it seemed so far fetched given my personal responsibilities to my family, right? Right. Yeah, you know, we are a two income family and my kids both play very expensive club sports. I'm not going to tell you. It's a lot. Volleyball and tennis. Didn't think oh, anything yeah. could be more expensive than club volleyball. I was wrong. Tennis is worse. And they travel for their sports. And I mean, the, our financial responsibilities were such that the idea of being a rogue entrepreneur was more of like a pipe dream. But especially in 2017, when I was going through breast cancer treatments, thinking this is crazy, there has to be a better way. And then the following years where I became more and more miserable in that particular job, then the idea it became more of a potential reality. Like I really, really wanted to pursue it. And so somewhere around 2019 was when my husband and I sat down and said, what would it take? Because he saw how unhappy I was sure. in my career and unfulfilled and frustrated. So then we started talking about what would it take for us to be a one income family and what would we have to do and eliminate and save and that was when we started planning for it. And so the plan always was actually for me to quit and start my entrepreneur career in the spring of 2020, because that would align mm -hmm. with when we could eliminate the cost of childcare, the driving and, and all that. And, and so the pandemic happened for me at exactly the right time, because we had already planned, do you know what I mean? For me to yeah. go rogue at that point, we had saved the money, we had a financial plan. And then the KU thing dropped in my lap, which was amazing. So that's given yeah. us just incredible air cover. So to answer your question, it was a gradual process. I've been wanting to work for myself for a long, long time and it started, but I didn't have any great idea, right? That starts with, you know, yeah. what, what are you going to do? Right. The idea, you know, other than being a marketing consultant, which didn't appeal to me, I, I just didn't have any business idea. And it wasn't until I went through my, you know, my breast cancer experience that, that the idea collided with my desire to be an entrepreneur. If that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I, well, and you mentioned Shark Tank. And so just to go off, to yeah. off topic of you for a minute, but sometimes on Shark Tank, I mean, you'll hear about these people who have taken all these loans and they're in incredible debt. Yeah. And it's wild to me because I'm just like, how has your spouse not really left at this point? So my spouse is amazing. I am I'm so unbelievably lucky. We are a team. Like I, we were talking before you started recording how I follow a lot of different breast cancer communities. And I think that what I see is that marriages either get, you know, molded in iron as a result of their cancer experience or they fall apart. And I'm so mm -hmm. grateful and lucky that my cancer experiences have only solidified my marriage. I have the most incredible partner <laughs> who mm. is so unbelievably supportive. I'm just unbelievably lucky and grateful. I don't I don't know how I I lucked into that, but I have an incredible support network in my my husband and then certainly my family. So, mm -hmm. you know, we live in the Midwest. Both of our parents are local. So, all of the little fill in the blanks where I need someone to pick up my son from school and take him to tennis or, you know, all these little things fill in the gap moments. We also have that community and support. So, I mean, all of these things contribute to my ability to, they contribute to a, my ability to have come through my cancers with a positive attitude. And then also my ability to be an entrepreneur, right? Like, I, you know, you, yeah. you have to have a support system. I don't know any successful entrepreneur that doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what what you're saying about founding your own company. And I've talked to a few founders and other, you know, other people too, but what I notice is they all planned and they all planned with their partner. Yes. yes. And they all had a timeline. Yeah. That was like, if I can't do this in this amount of time, I have to go do something else kind of. Yeah. And that's part of the deal, right? Like I, yeah. part of the plan was the first two years of bomb box, I would go salary free, but come year three, I need to pull a salary. And if I don't, then we need to really think through whether this mm -hmm. is a passion project or a real business. And and I think mm -hmm. that that's fair and reasonable, you know, like it can't be forever putting my husband in the position of being the sole breadwinner. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And that shows a partnership, like, you know, people say partner, but it's a, it shows that it is a partner, not just someone oh my gosh, who totally. you've lived with for many years and that's who you're, or you're married to or whatever. So as far as, I guess, looking at your company 
and you and you have you worked in a wide variety of things before and i do think like working in marketing right you got a perspective of different parts of the business i think there's a few jobs where you get a perspective of different parts of the business and one is marketing for sure so as far as just creating your products and your product set and stuff and you're picking out the goods and probably testing them and, and how's that process been for you i mean just being a merchandiser really is what you've had to do. Yeah. Well, so a couple of things. I mean, I take, you take things from different jobs, right? So I do remember going back all the way. My first job out of grad school was working at hallmark.com and I was in the advertising department at Hallmark. And I don't know if you remember this at all, or if you in the States, this would have been early 2000s. Hallmark was going through a huge product strategy reinvention and it was going to take them a couple of years. So they were relying on the promotions team to come up with one-off the promotional products that could be quick manufactured and get people into stores to buy cards while they were reinventing the product line. And this was mm. at the time when they when the Beanie Babies were being yeah. retired and that was what they needed to replace. And they weren't going to do that overnight. And so I learned a ton about product testing through that process. And that is how Hallmark came up with the Kiss Kiss Bears. I don't know if you remember these, but these were like little teddy bears with Mm -hmm. little magnets in their lips. And then smoosh them together and they would kissy, you know, and the magnets would touch and they would be kissy, kissy, kissy bears. And they were like a huge hit and they weren't a hit out of nothing. They were tested. (laughs) They knew that they were a hit before they went and invested in a bunch of plush toys with magnets in their lips. And of course, (laughs) because Valentine's Day is the number one. Yeah a holiday for homework. So you can, you start with that. So that what has always stuck with me watching a promotional product become a hit and the process that they used to test and the target and how they did that testing at the time, it was really new to do it all online instead of doing it in like physical facilities. And it worked really well. And it was a really great validation of internet survey functionality, yeah. which again, you know, 22 years ago, it was, it was new. So you kind of start with that. And then you move forward to different jobs where, um, so at Hallmark, I had a very, I had a position that was very marketing communications heavy. I managed email marketing and, and like I said, part of this market research element, but I knew nothing about business operations mm-hmm. until I went to work for smaller businesses. And so, for example, when I went to, when I was director of marketing at Lyric Opera of Kansas City, I was part of the executive leadership team. And I contributed to building out that PL. And I had a really good understanding of how the cost of the sets and costumes for Carmen compared to the cost and sets of costumes for La Boheme and what the draw of those particular titles would be, what the, the overall you know, revenue versus cost versus overhead look like. And so again, product development in entertainment is a little different, right? Than Mm -hmm. physical product development. But again, you kind of put these different experiences together and you have a bigger appreciation for how to build out a business. So in, I, you know, I have written marketing plans before. This was the first time I wrote a business plan where I really had to think through not just the cost of my advertising and what kind of revenue it would generate, but what would it cost me to build out, you know, to have a a website, what does it cost to host? What does it cost to keep it active? What, you know, all of these other incremental costs, but the good news is because I had contributed to the business planning for those smaller businesses, I had a really good feel for it. And that was again, really good training for when I I went, went solopreneur. Yeah. Yeah. And then, well, the question is how do I do that? So then I had, I understood, I had a template. I, you know, I started building out what all of the different costs would be. I, I manage, I do my own bookkeeping. My mother-in-law is a tax preparer and she's always said, and I so agree with her that as an entrepreneur, you will never understand your business better unless you do your own bookkeeping. She really encouraged me not to, you know, hire a bookkeeper and accountant and to do it myself. And she's totally correct. So mm-hmm. I have a really good feel for what it takes to run my business on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that I don't think I would have if I didn't do my own bookkeeping. So it's yeah. a little bit tedious, but it for sure is, it helps me see things. I will also say until I became my own bookkeeper for my own business, I now feel kind of sorry for all of the bosses where as the director of marketing or VP of marketing, I would scream and cry about how marketing wasn't getting enough money. And now I'm looking at my p going, oh, marketing is so expensive. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so now I appreciate a little bit better. <laughs> that oh, yeah. 
Well, I'm so I'm like so cheap about spending other people's money. I don't know what my problem is. because I'm really bad with my money. But like at work, I, I'm I'm in marketing now and it's mm-hmm. it's new for me. But my boss will kind of be like, OK, well, what do we need to get? And I'm like, I don't know. I can do this for free. <laughs> like everything. It's so ridiculous. But my mom had and, and dad had their own business. They had an auto repair shop. But I remember my mom did all her books and she knew it was pretty impressive, like knew the price of all the air filters and all the parts and all the oil and yeah, things yeah. like that. And it's and I didn't appreciate it as a kid, like what she was doing. And I always think she hasn't valued herself enough because she really did run a business, run all her books and know all the cost of goods. And yeah. now for you, like you have to know yeah. about shipping too and storing yes. and all yes. that yes. stuff, I which really I worked in feel. warehouse management. And it's a lot. It is a lot. And yes, shipping is next. I mean, number one cost every month is advertising. (laughs) And then (laughs) shipping is right up there in terms of just hard costs. And so I am very, very on top of changes to shipping costs and editing those in charges and monkeying with pricing, all of that. And that is the nice thing that I'm really loving, obviously working for myself is I don't have to any, there's no permission. There's no, you know, mm-hmm. review process. If I have an idea, I can throw something out there and see what sticks. So it's, it's, I do love that, that freedom. Yeah. yeah, totally. So in looking at your creation of your company, because you identified a need because of your experience with cancer and with cancer mm-hmm. several times, and I guess several types, right? Yeah. You, you've spent a lot of time uniquely and unfortunately, but just, I'm, I'm like, just grateful to be talking to you because I I know part of what you've gone through. And I was just thinking too, about like your experience with just going through that so many times, like how did you change your relationship with your body over time and just dealing with it, basically doing that stuff? Yeah. I, you know, certainly it's hard to say, right. I mean, my, I, my very first cancer was a melanoma, which um, is lethal, right? It's a, it's a very scary cancer. And I had that cancer and I was diagnosed when and I age everything up by my kids, right? As a total mm-hmm. mom. So I, uh, my son was one and my daughter was three mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and so you, you know, still, you know, postpartum, right? <laughs> From yeah. the baby. And then my last was in 2017. My kids were like, what is it? 12 and 14. So it was my feeling about my body changes, you know, changes over the course of your thirties and forties, I think naturally. And certainly I have more appreciation for the fighting spirit of my ability to overcome things. I think the first time I was diagnosed with cancer, I was in the panic mode. And, And that was such a crazy, crazy experience. If I go back to that time, I had a mole on my upper thigh and it was Mm -hmm. summertime and I was at the pool with my parents. My son was one and he was, you know, that baby thing, you know, where they decide to just have a little nap in the moment. And so he was sleeping on my chest and I was sitting on a a pool lounge chair and I had my legs kind of hitched up in a weird position to basically keep him anchored to my body so he wouldn't fall off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I only say that because my mom was sitting next to me and she kept looking at this mole on my thigh saying, I don't like the look of that mole. You need to go get that checked out. And I blew her off. I was like, and I only say that I was in that position because I don't know that she would have like really paid a whole lot of attention to a mole on my upper thigh. Um, And so she really nagged me about that mole for a while. I mean, it was for like weeks after she would text me and, and email me and ask me if she wanted her to make an appointment for me at her dermatologist. I mean, just all that, like she was just really, yeah. really aggressively Jewish mom. And finally, just to get her to shut up, I went to the dang dermatologist yeah. and the dermatologist didn't like the look of the mole either. She took it off, scraped it off in the, in the, that day said, well, we're going to biopsy this and we'll just take a look at it. I didn't think anything of it. And three mm. days later she called to say, Hey, just want to let you know that's melanoma. I'm going to make an appointment with a surgeon. It's too big for us to do the surgery in the office. You have to go to an actual, you know, surgical center and I'm going to make an appointment and I don't care what's on your calendar. You're going to go to that appointment. And so I went from, they took the a little skin sample on a Friday. It was a holiday weekend, I think. So then on Tuesday, she called to give me the diagnosis. Wednesday, I met with a surgeon. Friday, I had surgery. Like wow. there was no time to plan. And everyone kept saying, if the cancer has spread, you got a year to live. And if you 
if it hasn't spread, no biggie, just wear more sunscreen. I mean, and that's just a really broad wow. choice. And so, I mean, going back to that kind of air cover, you know, that was in some ways it was wonderful having like little kids at home, right. That are just little need machines. They have no idea what's going on. So we're home with the toddlers. My mom, Oh, fun fact about my mom. At the time, my dad was working on this project in Asia and my mom was getting on a plane to go join him in China and she hadn't seen him in like weeks and was so excited for this big trip to China. And I called to say, you're not going to believe this. I have melanoma. I have to have surgery in the next couple of days. I, you know, I was panicked and mm. she turned to the stewardess and said, I need to get off this plane. Like, oh my God, this is post 9-11. I have no idea how they let her off that plane. <laughs> She's amazing. Right. And she was with us all weekend. And like, she was sort of like, I keep talking about how she was the adult in the room that kind of kept us all grounded. And then Monday we got the call. It hadn't spread. I was fine. Buy some mm. more sunscreen and some hats and, and have a nice life, which is a lot to process in the course of a week. <laughs> it was yeah. just a lot. And then not even a year later, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and that one at the time, again, it was such a, it was the whole 180 where they said, well, it's a really slow moving cancer. And we want you to do all this like super long list of labs before you get into surgery. So we're going to schedule your surgery for like six to eight weeks from now, but go ahead and knock out these labs before then. And at the time I was so panicked, like I have cancer in my body. Don't you want to get it out immediately? Isn't my surgery yeah. Friday? And they were like, no, no, you're good. It's fine. And at the time, it stressed me out that I had to wait. And now in retrospect, it was a gift. Like that time was great. It gave me time to plan. I had childcare in place. In my last, my job before that, I had to like drop out of everything I was doing to go hmm. have surgery. That was craziness. Whereas being able to plan for it was lovely. It was a, it was a gift, even though it was very stressful at the time. And then unfortunately, I had a really, really rare side effect as a result of that surgery, which landed me in the hospital for an extra two and a half weeks, wow. uh, which was not fun. I don't recommend it. Zero out of 10, do not recommend. And eventually kind of got my health back on track. And I think, so you ask about how I think about cancer and my health. That was that year after having thyroid surgery was the hardest physically for me. I had this really rare side effect that made me hypocalcemic, which means that my body doesn't process calcium like a normal human. And so what would happen is I would get low on calcium and then you need calcium in your bloodstream to process motor function and oh. heart and muscle function. And so what happens is if you go into some variation of hypoglycemic shock, then your muscles stop working and eventually it gets to your heart, your heart stops pumping and you die. And mm. so my calcium would just drop and I would start feeling tingles and numbness in my hands and my lips and my face. And that would be a sign that I needed to get to the ER to get IV calcium. But it's so rare that I would have to explain this over and over and over again to the ER tech saying, I need IV calcium. I know what I need. You have about an hour. Let's, let's get the calcium going. And, and it's not like something they have on hand. It's not common. Um, right. There was one time where I was in an ER where the poor nurse, like they didn't have anything in like a drip bag. So she just stood there with a syringe slowly <laughs> just my dripping it into my vein so that I wouldn't die. So going through that was really hard. And I, that was when I started to, when we talked a little bit before about advocating for myself because mm -hmm. I was working with an endocrinologist that kept saying, well, your labs are normal, so you should be fine. But then I would end up in the ER in hypoglycemic shock. Like, no, I'm not fine. I don't know what, maybe my body just needs more calcium than the normal human. I don't know. Or maybe this test is flawed. I don't, I don't know, yeah. but I can't make this up. <laughs> Trust me. I'm not trying to. And mm -hmm. so and I would complain that I was just so tired and I was more tired than I ever was in my life. Even when I had babies that weren't sleeping through the night, like this, something was wrong. And he was like, nah, you're a working mom. Working moms are always tired. And I was no. like, yeah, you're fired. <laughs> yeah. I didn't say that yeah. out loud. I wish I did at the time, but I didn't. And so I just left, didn't make a follow-up appointment and, and went to go see somebody else who would listen to me. And in the mm -hmm. meantime, waiting to get to a different endocrinologist, a friend of a friend turned me on to this. I keep calling her the crazy doctor lady. She was an MD. She ran a health spa. She was one of those early med spa folks that was using, what do you call it? Botox to help mm -hmm. migraine patients, mm -hmm. which I think has become a more common cure. But at the time, it's 10 years yeah. ago, much, much more controversial and not common. And so she looked at my labs and said, you know, I feel like you're behaving like someone that might be celiac. Why don't you drop gluten? See what happens. And I dropped gluten and she put me on this, um, you know, in a low carb, high protein diet, 
a bunch of other nutritional supplements. And within six weeks, I had dropped 15 pounds. I felt like I woke up. I wasn't so tired all the time. I eventually got to an endocrinologist that adjusted my meds, gave me a totally different mix of things to kind of solve for this calcium deficit. And I haven't been in hypoglycemic shock since. And so I think that that whole process of learning to listen to my body and advocate for myself was hugely formative as I got into my final two cancer diagnoses. So my third one was when I had basal cell skin cancer on my nose, which is really not lethal, not a big deal. The problem was, of course, it was just big enough on my nose that they needed to take off and it it required plastic surgery to cover the hole in my nose. So I would have skin covering my nose. Yeah. 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 You can't really tell in this video because it's, it's not really good, but I'm, I have a lot of freckles. And so normally what okay. they do in this situation is they would take skin from somebody's neck and then kind of use that to patch the hole in the nose. But because of my freckle pattern, that wouldn't work. It would just look like I had a big old blotch, you know, in my nose. So I learned right through this whole process. Okay. This isn't lethal. I have a hot set to figure out what I want to do. And so I went to the plastic surgeon, you know, to get the to discuss what the options were, this original plastic surgeon wanted to create a, a a scar where he would start from the inside. I'm putting my finger like on the inside of my eye line and then cut all along my cheek line, all the way down to my chin, and then use that to somehow kind of jerry rig the skin to cover up the nose section that would needed to be cut off. And so I said, mm. so I'm going to have a scar running from my eye to my chin. And yes. And that was his, that was the one ch- That was what he wanted to do. And I was like, well, gosh, that really, I mean, I'm in my thirties and I don't want to be super vain, but I don't want to be Scarface. Like that really sucks. Like that. Yeah. Well, it seems unnecessary. Another another plastic surgeon. See, there's another alternative. And so I asked around and I used my network and I found the, the plastic surgeon in my area who was quote unquote great with faces. And, and he had a totally different surgery where he would cut along the shadow line of my nose and that it was a crazy surgery. It was bananas. It was a two-part surgery. The first time they would cut along the nose, they would get rid of this cancer. And then he did this crazy thing where he stretched out the skin. So he separated the skin between my face and my cheekbones. Like, you know, when you're like putting, like stuffing a turkey or a chicken, you're inside. That's what they were doing to my face. And I was awake for it. Do not recommend it. Oh my gosh. And then you, you hang out. And you wait a week and let the skin just loosen up and then go back to have it all closed up. And in this process, you walk out without a scar. And so it was a miserable medical treatment to go through, but I chose it. And I chose it knowing that this was what was going to save me from being scar faced for the rest of my life. And so knowing that this was the resolution that I chose and that I wanted was made all the difference Mm. in kind of dealing with walking around with an open wound on my face and the misery of that surgery, because now I don't look like a scar face, right? You can't tell. Yeah. I mean, you really can't. Yeah. He was really amazing. And when it's time to fix any kind of droops, like I'll be calling Frank Rannick. <laughs> he was really good. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, you know, you learn, right? So all this process yeah. of learning. And then with my breast cancer, in some ways it was the same thing where trying to decide whether to get a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, trying to decide whether I was going to do radiation or, you know, tamoxifen, all these things to me are a conversation, right? It's, it's, I met with a couple different doctors and have learned now that I like to work with doctors who are open to a conversation about the options and the puts and takes of each option. I don't respond well to medical dictators. And, Mm. and I don't know that I would have known that or known that I could interview doctors for as much a personality mesh as a medical opinion as I Mm. did 10 years ago when I first started. And so in some ways I'm really grateful for all my other cancers because they helped me navigate the breast cancer, which in some ways was the most complicated with more confidence. And I did take my time to look at all the different treatment plans. I mean, one of the things that I learned through this whole breast cancer treatment element is that so many of the long-term studies are a blend of women between the ages of 35 and, and 80. And I wanted to look at studies and outcomes for premenopausal women, because I think that that is a different lifespan, right? And that's a, that's yeah. a different question than the older community. And, and those are more new and more nuanced. And so doctors willing to have that conversation with me and entertain my quest, my need for information were the people I wanted and wanted to work with and chose to work with. And mm-hmm. to this day, I'm really grateful. I feel, I mean, 
I think that yeah. I came out of it, it not feeling like my body is broken, which I think would be very easy to feel. Instead, I'm really feel like, man, I'm a warrior, right? Like I survived all yeah. this stuff. I'm, I'm forged and iron. I'm good. Yeah. I mean, and I, like, I haven't gone through that, but just seeing, observing different people going through it and different outcomes and just also knowing for myself, like just hearing you say about the gluten thing and, you know, just with me getting diagnosed with celiac, it took years and it took me having to say, no, it's not because I'm a woman and my period. It's not yeah, that right? because I was, I was iron deficient and with my weight, it didn't make any sense. And what I eat did not make any sense. And so then they were like, Oh, it's, we need to do a hysterectomy. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, and so then it was just a simple blood test I found out about that said, Oh yeah, you have this protein that indicates that you're probably, you know, at least intolerant of gluten and then an endoscopy, which was very easy as a procedure and, yeah. and out of the yeah. hospital in like an hour. And then I was like, oh, you have celiac, so just stop eating gluten. And then, yeah, it changed my life. It changed my mental health and everything, yeah. you know? So it to me, it's just, I think it's great that you were able to figure out how to be your own advocate. And I think so many people don't do that because of how the medical system, I mean, especially in the States, is set up, but also even here. It is. And I will it's really say hard the other here thing too. that is, you know, I say this with humility. I The reason I was able to navigate and be my own advocate was because I threw a lot of money at it. And I'm so unbelievably lucky that we could afford to do that. You know, so many other patients don't have that flexibility mm -hmm. and that's what's so frustrating. Certainly. Yeah. Especially it's awful. in the States. Yeah. 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 And even here, I mean, just trying to do certain things. I mean, it's really lucky in the sense that if you have a condition or something that they can handle fine, but if it's something too much or, you want different opinions, it's really hard to do. So that is a good point that there's a, there's a part of that too. There's a cost. There's a cost to all this stuff. It's not necessarily covered by insurance and, mm -hmm. and even things covered by insurance you have to fight for. So it's there advocating for oneself does not ever end. Yeah, that's true. And it's in other situations too, not just with medical, but that's a big one. Yes. I think to a certain extent, learning to advocate for myself medically has also taught me to advocate in other ways, like, okay, throw your critical analysis hat on. Does this make sense to you? Does it pass the sniff test? It doesn't. Well, then let's just ask. Let's just, yeah. you know, let's just see if yeah. there's another alternative. 100%. So besides the business, and even I think even you starting that kind of parallels to, you know, that, that question of like, what would be most helpful to someone, right? Yeah. And it really does. So besides that, and your work at at the University of Kansas School of Business, you also are involved in some community work as well, I right? I am. My first kind of, well, I've always been, you know, on the PTA and whatever, involved in my kids' schools. But my very first foray into political advocacy and in just becoming more involved in my community started in 2016. I was working at Lyric Opera of Kansas City, a nonprofit arts organization. I'm sure you can imagine very liberal-minded individuals that worked there. We were all really devastated after Trump won the election in 2016. We were just I mean, everyone, it was the funniest thing. Everyone wore black to the office the next day. It was just, without yes. planning it, it just happened. At the time, some issues started popping up locally and started really focusing on this whole concept of, you know, think globally, act locally. And mm -hmm. a connection from the opera was getting more and more incensed about this very particular issue in our elementary schools or in our, our school district. Do you remember the safety pin issue post Trump way back in 2016, there were many, many minority communities that were very stressed about Trump winning the election because he had come across as very, you know, racist and, and <laughs> terrible, and yes. which I don't think was totally wrong. And so a lot of teachers and people in the community were wearing safety pins to show that they were a safe person. Yes. And the superintendent of our local schools told teachers they weren't allowed to wear safety pins because that was a political message of some sort. Right. And the ACLU got involved and sued the school district. And that one question of, gosh, that seems like a crappy thing for the superintendent to get involved and to even make a statement about made me start to scratch the surface of a lot of other questions and things that were happening in my school district. that I just wasn't aware of because I wasn't paying attention yeah. and it made me realize, oh, I need to clue in. And if I want to be upset about all these like federal issues, I need to focus on my local community first. And so a group of moms 
and I organized a group called Education for Shawnee Mission. And Shawnee Mission is our school district, and we have been advocating for progressive school board candidates and policies since 2017. And it's just been this really wonderful grassroots education, right, in local politics and mm. the importance of advocacy and and all that stuff. And then we got involved with the Kansas governor race, as well as House and state representative races. And, you know, there's still a lot of really crazy things happening in the state of Kansas that we are not happy about. There's good news, bad news. The bad news is the rest of Kansas is is bananas crazy. We've got some some really questionable stuff running through our house right now. But the good news is that all of the legislatures from our area that we advocated for in our community are the ones out there fighting against it. And so I won't get into all of my local politics here, but I learned, right? So you learn how to advocate, right? So going back to advocate for myself, I'm advocating for my kids' school, my kids' school district. And I've loved that. It's been a really incredible, gratifying experience. I think at the time when I had organ- been part of that group organization, I kept thinking maybe this will solve my need to own something and be passionate without having the oversight right of a boss or or a board. And it again, it was a little bit of an entrepreneurial endeavor to create a grassroots organization with a bunch of other women, but it didn't solve it entirely. But certainly again, it was a great education and and I'm still on that board of directors. And since then, my daughter and I have joined National Charity League and I will be on their board next season. And so I have the opportunity to explore other local organizations in our community, everything from, you know, we gave out meals to homeless people a couple weeks ago. Uh, We're doing some work at a local food bank. I mean, so just other kinds of things where you try to, you know, make sure that the gaps in coverage and help and assistance needed in our community are being covered. So that's, you know, try to give back in those ways. I'm just, and no one can see us because we're not on video, but I'm (laughs) Grant, like, I'm just so grateful that to talk to someone who's doing that kind of work because for me service is a core value. And I think I've, I've tried to encourage people through this podcast to do a few things, but one of them is to serve yeah. and to, and it's in any way they can, you know, there are different things. Not everyone can, can, you know, start a grassroots organization, but certainly people can even just make sure their neighbor's okay. You know, if that's what they can do. The, the best part of, I mean, and certainly more with National Charity League than through ed- Education First Journey Mission is, is definitely more of a political, you know, communications sure. organization. But National Charity League has opened my eyes to how unbelievably privileged I am. Mm-hmm. And, you know, especially when I was going through treatments, radiation in particular, and it was so miserable and unhappy and feeling crappy, you know, I at least have a bed and... Yeah, I can buy whatever I want at the grocery store and I can pay for these expensive. I remember once I paid $40 for overnight shipping for a $9 aluminum free deodorant that I wanted to try. Like that is such yeah. a privilege, you know, yeah. to be able to do those things that in just in my community, the two miles away, people can't do. So I think mm-hmm. that reinforcing the importance of gratitude is also helpful. Yeah. And I think people in general, I'd say have started to understand what privilege means more than they used to. And I think it has been something that was politicized, which didn't need to be. No, you know, I it didn't too, need yeah. to be so politicized for us yeah. to understand that. Maybe not us, but it, just other people. But I think, you know, out of one thing I'm just noticing, I'd say a theme I'm getting from you is just out of difficult situations, whatever they are, you are someone who's tried to make something positive happen. And I don't know if you've recognized that in yourself, but that's what I'm recognizing, you know. Oh, that's so nice to hear. I mean, I I certainly take that from my grandparents, my grandmother in particular. My grandmother grew up in Poland and pre-World War II, Jewish, looked like me, very Aryan looking, although very Jewish, 100%. Mm -hmm. And she had five sisters, was married, had a son, and lived in the ghetto in Grodno and the walls were closing in. They knew that they were going to get shipped out. And so the family sent her to go find a hiding spot for her family. It took her a couple of days. When she came back, the Grodno um, ghetto had been emptied and her entire family had been killed. And so she ended up hiding herself in the hopes that she would be reunited with them. She hid in a variety of different places, ultimately met my grandfather in one of them after the war, you know, she confirmed that everyone was gone, married my grandfather. My mother was born in Poland. They eventually immigrated to the United States when my mom was six years old. It's a crazy wow. story. My grandmother 
I mean, think about what she suffered, right? Like that. Mm -hmm. And she was the most grateful person. She was filled with joy all the time, all the time. She was just so grateful for this second life. She says, you know, that, Mm. that she had. And I think about her all the time. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's incredible. So, and yeah, and just generationally how she passed that down. You know, my grandfather was not, he was really kind of the more you know stereotypical martyr and he was really frustrated and felt like the world owed him something for what he suffered through. Whereas my grandmother just was filled with gratitude and happy and, and very grateful for every day that she got that was extra from her point of view, this extra family, this, this bonus life. And so oh. I think about that a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's a great thing to have to center you really. So I guess the next thing is just to wrap up. I like to ask every guest, do you have any advice or mantra you'd like to share? I mean, you've already talked about a few things. So if you think we've covered it, then that's okay too. No, I think, I mean, I think at the end of the day, we talked a lot about, I think it's so important to advocate for yourself, ask questions, you know, make sure that you're working with either in in the medical field with doctors that share your, your values. And, And I think that that goes for, you know, work and life as well. I agree. It's hard. It's hard to be around people and or work for a company that you don't share some values with. And so I agree that people should empower themselves. So my next set of questions are just the fun five. And they're just the questions I like to ask at the end. They're they're fun for me to know about. So what's the oldest T-shirt you have and still wear? The oldest t-shirt I, you, is I still have a state college high school cheer t-shirt in my pajama drawer. <laughs> nice. It's got a couple holes in it, but it's really soft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's for, you know, pajamas or whatever. You it know. is. And in the, yeah. in the when I wore it in the 90s, that stylist wear things really oversized. So it fits. <laughs> I know. I, I constantly, I have a few shirts that are very old. This old Phil Collins shirt actually from like when I was in high school and I'm definitely, I've gained quite a bit of weight since then but it still fits and i'm like what in the world was i wearing back then <laughs> it's insane so yeah it's funny that style was actually useful to be honest with you so if every day was really groundhog's day like it like it felt when we were in the kind of the covid the part of covid where we did have to stay at home all the time what song would you have your alarm clock play every morning christina aguilera i'm a fighter nice was that your song basically for yeah. a lot of things? It's like my mantra. Nice. nice. All right. Coffee or tea or neither? Coffee. <laughs> Addicted. I will not give it up. I have I reflux. Don't care. I will take medicine. <laughs> I need coffee. <laughs> nice. Do you have any particular way you like your coffee? We, for our 19th wedding anniversary, but this super fancy, pretty fantastic coffee machine. And it makes Americanos and lattes and macchiatos. And it's the most awesome thing I've ever. And it grinds the beans and it was the biggest splurge I've ever. And I love it. (laughs) Nice. That's awesome. That's good. So can you think of a time that you laughed so hard you cried or just something that makes you crack up? I just always like to know what cracks people (laughs) up. Well, my husband is we got our dog back in 2015 and he'd never had a pet growing up. I know he had birds, which that doesn't count. So like he is always just so fascinated by dog behavior. So for sure, our dog's various like grunts and sounds and whale noises and behaviors are always funny to us. But now he's obsessed with like various dog videos, like people on TikTok and Instagram. And so he's currently obsessed with this, <laughs> this Clarence the dog category videos. And they are really funny. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. They're stu- they're stupid. Every day he he sends me a new dog video of some stupid really <laughs> dog video. I think they're the videos that he wishes he could come up with because our dog is also ridiculous, but yeah. Yeah, but I don't know how people do it cuz they do come up with these things and they get all these likes and views and stuff and cuz dogs are funny. I I tried to interview my sister's dog on this podcast and it was <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to you just in case you guys like it because it didn't get many views. Yeah, I was bumped, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> All right. And the last one, who inspires you right now? Well, I mean, right now, I I don't know about you, but I am obsessed with all the news and why not coming out of Ukraine. I think Zelensky is incredible. I am constantly hopeful that we get a good resolution for Ukraine that doesn't yeah. involve them being overtaken by Russia. I, I think his his leadership is just inspired and, and fascinating. 
it is and definitely share that hope as well. So if people want to find the bomb box or you, where should they go? The bomb B A L M B O X.com. And we're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn. And always start with the website, www.thebombbalmbox.com. Awesome. All right, Liz. Well, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks so much for being on more than work. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes. Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design, for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at, at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie A Comedy on TikTok. And the website is morethanworkpod.com. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.